Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another exciting J. Lamb bio video. Uh, as you know, my name is Joe Lamb, and uh, I'm introducing a new series this week. Very excited to introduce the series on integrated chemistry physics. Uh, this will be a course that will take the <laughs> course <laughs> of a year. Uh, this is video 1-1, and today we will be talking about the nature of science. So what are some basic things that we need to know in order to ensure success in our integrated chemistry physics course? Let's talk a little bit about our student learning objectives for the day. By the end of this video, you should be able to explain how to develop experiments and why scientists conduct them. You should also be able to measure materials using the SI system of measurements, communicate and interpret graphs, and differentiate between science and technology. So we got a lot to cover today. Uh, make sure we follow along very closely. Make sure you're taking notes. If you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand. It won't do any good because this is a video. So let's talk about uh, just a little bit of an introduction here. Let's consider the concept of farming. Now, farmers have used technology for nearly 10,000 years. You have to think back to when they were using ox and horses to plow the fields, planting the seeds manually. Um, and then through the course of time, you know, science and technology developed and we developed new ways to become more efficient at the farming process. That includes things like selective breeding, breeding cattle for their size or breeding different stalks of corn for the amount of yield that is produced from farming. Farmers nowadays even use global positioning satellites to better understand their farms, their fields, and where to be able to plant crops that are going to grow the best. So when we reflect, let's think about how technology has changed how we farm. And all that goes back to the nature of science, experimentation, and then utilizing those experiments and that information to develop technology to better help us succeed in the farming process. So in order to understand how the science works, we need to talk a little bit about the scientific method. And that's just simply a pattern of investigation procedures. That includes things like stating the problem, researching and gathering information, forming a hypothesis, which essentially is an educated guess. We test the hypothesis to see if our thoughts are true. We analyze data and draw conclusions based on that. I know you've probably seen the scientific method before in your biology classes and other classes before, but I want to make sure to give an opportunity to review that prior to going through and looking at this integrated chemistry physics course. So let's talk a little bit about forming a hypothesis. Now, I had a problem the other day. My distiller in my science prep room was not working. My distiller makes uh, water, it takes all the impurities out of water so I get just clean, fresh water. Um, and it stopped running. And so I looked at it and I tried to think about what are some of the possible ways where the distiller could have been broken. Maybe there was an electrical issue or maybe there was uh, an issue on the inside. Maybe it needed to be cleaned, something along those lines. Um, and then I noticed that uh, you know, it was plugged in and all that, so I, I unplugged it and I looked and I saw that the fuse had broken or the fuse had gone off on the electrical socket. And so I reset the fuse, plugged it back in, and it worked. And so in my mind, I actually formed a hypothesis, a possible explanation of the problem using information from your research. I did my research simply just by looking at it and trying to think about what the problem is. I then ran the experiment by resetting the fuse, plugging it back in, and fortunately it worked out. Uh, my distiller still works and saved me a couple thousand dollars, so that's really nice. But, you know, keeping these things in mind, forming a hypothesis, performing an experiment, you, you know these things. I just want to make sure to reiterate them. Let's talk a little bit about variables because that's part of things that we look at. We want to look at variables uh, as a quantity that can have more than a single value. So we look at variables as we go through and complete an experiment. And there are two types of variables we want to look at. The first one is the dependent variable, which changes based on other variables. Basically, it's what you want to find out in an experiment. So for example, on the example on the right here, we're testing uh, different chemicals. We're testing different food at we're testing different liquids to determine how well plants grow in those particular liquids. So what we're going to measure, what we're trying to find out, is how well the plants grow. So that's going to be the height. The independent variable is what's tested, which would be the liquid that is being used. The independent variable is the one thing that the experimenter changes. Um, and typically we limit that to one thing per experiment. The rationale for that is if you make multiple changes to an experiment and you get a change, then you don't know which of those variables actually caused the change, whether it was one or the other or both. We also want to control as many things as possible in the experiment. So if we look, we're using the same pot to grow the plant and we're using the same type of plant as well. The more controlled variables we have, the more we know if the independent variable actually caused the change in the dependent variable. 
Something that's very important in science is being objective. We want to make sure that our data reads true. And a lot of times bias or expectations that changes how the results are analyzed can play a role in that, especially if we're looking for a specific result. So for example, if I know that this particular additive allows plants to grow, or if I think it does, and I run an experiment, and let's say I own the company, I'm obviously going to have bias to have the results come back positive, that the plant grows more when it's used when this particular additive is being used. A lot of times we use models to represent an idea, event, or object. And you see these all the time when we've looked at things in biology, for example, a model of how a cell works, the model of photosynthesis, respiration, those types of things. A theory is an explanation of things or events based on observations or investigations. So a theory is really why something happens, whereas a law is the statement about things that is always true. So for example, gravity is a law. We know that gravity happens, and it's always true. There's really not much of a theory because we don't really understand why objects have gravity. We understand that they have mass, and that the more mass that they have, the more gravitational pull that they have, but we really don't understand the fundamental reasons why, on a molecular level, that objects have gravity. Let's talk a little bit about measurement. You're going to be using a system in this class known as the SI unit, and that's a system of units that are used throughout the world, mostly. There are three countries that don't use the SI units, and that is Liberia, Myanmar, and the good old US of A. Prefixes are being used to represent big or small numbers. So if you look at the, the uh, materials that you're looking at on the right, you have mass, which is measured in grams, length in meters, time in seconds. We can alter those based on prefixes that we use. So for example, a centimeter is one one hundredth of a meter, meaning that 100 centimeters will fit into one meter. Same thing with millimeters. 1,000 millimeters will fit into one meter. These prefixes apply to all of the different SI units, so I could have centigrams, I could have centiseconds, I could have centimoles. So all of these things can utilize these prefixes. You'll get a chart and you'll get a table to easily be able to utilize these. But the ones you really want to make sure you're going to know are kilo, centi, and milli. And know how those work when you go through and do something called a unit conversion. Conversions use fractions of equal values in the numerator and denominator with different units to convert between them. Let me show you what I mean by doing an example problem. How long in centimeters is a 3,075 millimeter rope? So if we analyze this problem and we look and we see, we have a number of 3,075 millimeters. So that's the number we're going to start with when we do our dimensional analysis. So 3,000. 75 millimeters. A couple rules of thumb that you will want to remember. Whatever unit is on top of the first step must go on the bottom of the next step. So we're going to put millimeters here. Well based on the prefixes that we looked at, I know I can convert millimeters to meters. And there are 1,000 millimeters in a meter. Okay. So the key thing to remember here is that these units are the same length. They are in different units, but the values of them are the same. One meter is the same distance as 1,000 millimeters. And now I keep doing this process until I get to my final destination, which is centimeters. So I'm going to take whatever unit's on top of the first step, and it goes on the bottom of the next. And then I'm going to convert to centimeters. And there are 100 centimeters in one meter. A good way to check to make sure that if you did this correctly is to cross off your units. I know that if I have a unit on top of a numerator and the one on the bottom of a denominator, that they are going to cancel, just like in math class. If I'm left with the unit that I want at the very end, then I know I am done. And now I just need to do the math. 3,075 divided by 1,000 times 100. And my answer is 307.5 centimeters. And you can do this for a variety of different conversion factors that you'll see in a later video. Let's have a discussion about a few more things that we want to look at before we end this video. Let's talk about volume. Volume is the amount of space that is occupied by an object, and the formula for that is length times width times height. Liquid volumes are typically measured in liters or milliliters, while solid volumes are typically measured in centimeters cubed. One milliliter is equal to one centimeter cubed, so there's a nice little conversion factor between the two. 
Let's talk a little bit about mass and density. Matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. So basically everything on this planet, solid, liquid, or gas, is matter. Even air is matter. It takes up space and has mass. The mass is very small, but still has mass nonetheless. Mass is the quantity of matter in an object. The more mass it has, or the larger the mass it has, the more matter there is. Remember that mass is measured in grams. Density is mass per unit of volume. So for example, a 10 gram object, 10 grams of an object takes up, that takes up two centimeters cubed would have a density of five grams per centimeter cubed. Remember that density is mass per unit of volume. So you would take mass, divide it by volume, and that would give you your density. If you look at all of the things on the right hand side here, the things with the lower density are at the top, while things with greater density are towards the bottom. This is known as a density column and is pretty cool to look at. Last couple things we want to talk about time. Time in this class is measured in seconds and minutes, just like everywhere else in the world. That sounded really sarcastic, and in a way it kind of was. Temperature is the measure of kinetic energy that matter has. In science, you'll primarily use the Celsius scale, but sometimes you'll use Kelvin, where C is plus 273 equals Kelvin. So if you look here, we're probably most familiar with the Fahrenheit temperature scale. The Fahrenheit temperature scale has water freezing at 32 degrees Fahrenheit and boiling at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Celsius is nice because water freezes at zero and boils at 100, and then everything else is scaled based on that. Kelvin is what's known as an absolute temperature scale, meaning that there are no values below zero. That's why the numbers are so high. Freezing water is 273 Kelvin, while boiling water is 273 Kelvin. Notice that there's a 100 degree difference between Celsius and one, a 100 number difference between Kelvin. So they're similar scales, the only difference is one has 273 added to it. Let's briefly talk about graphs. Graphs provide visual representation of data. Looking at linear graphs, we plot points on the x-axis, usually the independent variable, and the y-axis, the dependent variable. Graphs can also be bar graphs, pie charts. We'll probably look at quite a few of those as we go through this course. Lastly, let's focus on technology. Technology is the application of science. Consider all of the advances that are on the right-hand side of the screen due to scientific research and studies. Things like computers, Wi-Fi technology, cameras, light bulbs, all of this originated as science and science experiments. We can then apply the information we learn from our scientific experiments in order to create some really cool stuff. So hopefully you understand the learning objectives from this video, and hopefully it was pretty clear. You'll have a couple homework assignments over this, but hopefully you guys have a pretty clear understanding of the basics of science and what it is. Hopefully a lot of this was a review for you, but as always, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. This is Jay Lambayo, and have a great day. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.